Okay, everything looks about right on here. And uh, I lost a few pieces off of it from the bottom. So it's probably going to rock just a little bit. But it still should work just fine. It can use some maintenance. Now this right here is my shock ladybug. Uh, let me tip it so you can see it. It's easier than moving the camera. Okay, so if you've seen the spinning wheels with the different colored plastic drive wheels, those are the ladybugs. And it is a flyer lad wheel. If there is anybody out there who doesn't know what flyer lad means, it means that the drive band uh, controls the flyer. I have a Luet too, and it's a bobbin lad wheel, which means that the drive band actually goes onto the bobbin itself. And it's the bobbin that's turning and not the flyer, not controlling the fiber. So this one is a flyer lad. My flyer's turning, not my bobbin. And the Luet is bobbin lad. The bobbin is turning, not the flyer. What difference does it make? Uh, it makes a couple differences. The biggest difference is on the bobbin lead wheels like the Luet, the uptake or the pull that you're getting on your yarn is stronger than on the flyer lead wheel. So traditionally, the flyer lead tension, which is also called scotch tension for reasons I don't know, and the, the bobbin lead one is called uh, Irish tension. And... I don't really know why they're called that. At any rate, when you're using a flyer lead wheel, you are going to have less take up, less pull, less resistance on the yarn, and you are able to spin thinner yarns. Whereas with the bobbin lead wheels, you're getting a lot of take up, a lot of pull, and so it's a little harder to spin thin yarns. That's just like conventional wisdom. I spun with the Luet for years and I just spin wherever I want. So just put that out there. Okay, so here we go. Uh, also, what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to place a dry band in the grooves on the whirl, depending on how you want to spin your yarn. So the smallest groove down here is the one that the rotation is for every turn of the small wheel it's a well i should say for every turn of the drive wheel it's a multiple and smaller turn of the flyer here and i can't remember what my ratios are for the uh the shock because i never really worried about it <clears throat> the bigger groove that you have these on, the smaller amount of rotations you get from each turn of the drive wheel. Like I said, I never really worry about that because I'm accustomed to the Luet and I just put everything on the largest whirl and I treadle faster and I control the size of the yarn from my hands. So there's, like I said, there are some practical uses for it. I'm just accustomed to doing it without the help of the ratios, the same way I would do it if I was spinning on a spindle. So I never really worry about it. But if, you, if you're curious and you don't know, just check your wheel manual. It'll tell you what the ratios are. So I'm going to spin a medium weight yarn. Something that is a little lighter than worsted, but a little more than sport. Okay? Basically, that's what I'm looking for. I could switch to the larger world. I'm not even going to worry about that. I'm going to just stay here. So, if, like, if the fiber police are watching me and they're, you know, commenting about I'm on the wrong world setting, we'll be just fine. Okay, now, my brake band seems good. I like to turn the brake band down and adjust it as I need it. And that depends a lot on what I'm spinning. 
I don't want a lot of pull on the brake band for Angora. This seems... That's not bad. That gives me just enough pull, but not enough that it's going to pull the Angora out of my hands. Maybe I'll crank it up once. Right, here's my bat. And since I took this off the drum carter, here's how I like to do my bats. You could make roll eggs. You could roll them in the punies. You can pull them through and turn them in the roving. There's lots of ways you can do this. But I, if, if I can keep it simple, that's my preferred method to do it. So it comes off the drum carter like this. And all I really have to do is unravel it and pull myself off a sliver. Okay, no Rolex. I don't need time for all that pretty stuff. Just keep it nice and simple. I'm going to tease this out just a bit. And here's where the important part comes in. This is my spinner's control card. I've used it so much now, I really don't need it. But I thought I'd show it to you. Oh, and I, there's my orifice hook. I was just starting to wonder what that thing was. Okay, so. Here's my spinner's control card. And basically, what this thing is, I'm trying to see if I can get it. Oh yeah, you can see it really nice now. On a spinner's control card, there are markings. And the markings, oh, there we go. It says fingering, sport, um, DK, worsted. And it gives you the approximate wraps per inch. Okay. And then on the side of the card is a two inch wrap gauge. So you can check. Now what I do is the little grooves here show you what thickness that a single ply should be to make a two ply yarn so that if i am spinning and i want to check if my yarn is the size necessary for what it is i say i'm spinning i spin it lay it across the card let me get that so you can see that and i could check This is a really cool device. After using this for so many years, I almost don't even need it anymore. Because I know exactly, well, not exactly, but I have a pretty good idea about how thick that this should be in order to get what I needed. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on to the leader. And I am, like, really lazy. I just tie it on. There's all kind of other tricks to get things onto your leader. And, and you know, the Luet has a thing in the bobbin where you stick it down there and you can like loop it through and all that kind of stuff. I just tie it on. Okay, so looking at this right here, I already know that this is my drafting zone. What I see in this drafting zone is going to be too thin for the yarn that I want. So I'm going to go ahead and add more into my drafting zone. So, people always say that, oh, when you're a new spinner, you should be glad that, you know, the thick yarn you spun because when you start learning how to spin, you are going to have a hard time making thin yarns. You're going to have to put plies and plies and plies. And I love you guys, but I'm going to say fooey to that. Here's what you need to know. You need to know how much fiber to put in your drafting zone, okay? Hand and eye coordination and spinning coordination and memorization of the thicknesses. You tell your mind that I need about this much fiber in the drafting zone to know, to get the size that I want. So as you are adding fiber to that drafting zone, it's your responsibility to keep your eye on the prize. And that is how you get consistently different sizes 
for two ply yarn. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna have a look. I can ply back. When I ply back, look at that. I don't know if you can see that. When I ply back, I'm like, ooh. This part was nice. I started talking to you guys. I got a little thicker right here. So I need to go back to here. I remember what that looks like. That's beautiful. And also, you have to keep in mind your fiber. And Gora uh, is going to fool once it's wet. So I could get away with a little thinner because I know that it's going to poof. So I'm going to spin my yarn just a little thinner anticipating that this is something you only know by of course somebody telling you or by experience I can tell you that Cheviot blooms very little so whatever Cheviot looks like to me when I spin it when it is full it's gonna be about the same size I can tell you that um, Jacob Jacob wool fools a whole lot and when I'm spinning Jacob wool, I know that once it is full washed and fooled, it'll be almost one and a half times the thickness of what I'm seeing when I am spinning and plying. So it's just one of those things you, you kind of have to know about each fiber. I'm a firm believer in breed samples so that I have that kind of information about the fibers that I'm using. So here I am keeping my eye because if I talk too much, Something like this is going to happen where I thinned it out. So I'm just going to back it back out. Take it to the place where I want it. And just attach it and start again. Maybe take it a little slower. Angora is a fiber that requires high twist. And I've, I have this with some wool. And I find that whenever you have Angora blends, if you have more than 25%, of Angora it basically spins like it's Angora so although I've got this really nice BFL I'm going to spin this as if I'm spinning 100% Angora I'm gonna give it the twist I could get away with a little less because BFL is going to felt my Angora the Angoras that I have raised I had no success with felting I have put Angora in the washing machine and the dryer to full it, and I have had no felting. Your mileage may vary. I raised French. That may be a French thing. I know people who have raised English. I believe Candy is the one I'm thinking about. And she's washed and dried her items, and she's had little to no felting. So it just depends on your breed, on your lines, sometimes on your animal. So I don't count on fooling or felting Angora to hold it together. It, it needs to twist. The BFL will felt if I need it to, but I'm still gonna put the right amount of twist in it for Angora. So I'm keeping consistent in my drafting zone. It's all about consistency in your drafting zone. If I was to tell you nothing else about spinning, I would tell you practice the practice with your eye, seeing how much fiber you need in the drafting zone and feeling it for whatever thickness of yarn you want. And once you master that, basically you can make the yarns that you want. I'm just watching this drafting zone. And the more consistent I am in the drafting zone, the more consistent the yarn is. Got a thin spot right there. I was running my mouth. I can choose to ignore it, depending on what I'm making, or I can fix it. And I just, all I did was took a little bit of fiber, laid it over that spot, and spun it right in. Bam. Okay. Someone asked me once about joining fibers. You fix fibers and you join fibers the same way. I'm just taking this end that's twisted. I'm laying it into the drafting zone and I'm letting the twist go up and catch that. I 
I am spinning worsted, which I do mostly because I like worsted yarn. I don't really like poofy um, woolen yarn, but I can spin woolen. So if you want a woolen demonstration, I'll just pick something else and spin woolen for you. The biggest difference between the woolen, I know we had this discussion a long time ago, is a lot of times people associate worsted with a short um, forward draw. And you can do worsted with a short backwards draw too. The key component that makes this, well, two key components that make this worsted and not woolen is first the pret. Usually top is combed or hackled into a worsted prep. So this wasn't really a worsted prep, but it was kind of a worsted prep because I actually laid the fibers out and ran them straight through the drum carter. I didn't allow the drum carter to jumble them. So it was semi worsted. And secondly, the most important is that I am smoothing down the fiber with my fingers at the drafting zone. If I was spinning woolen, I would completely let go of the fiber and I would not put any type of smoothing on it as the fibers went from the drafting stone up into the twist. In the case of the worsted, I am constantly smoothing and compacting this fiber down, not leaving any air in it, making a very hard worsted spin. I'm trailing pretty fast. It's kind of like a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's probably a good waltz beat. And I would probably say I'm getting, I want to say maybe 10 rotations of the flyer for every turn of the wheel. I think that's what the ratio is for that one. What I'm not doing, if you notice, is I'm not holding the fiber. Uh, a lot of times as newbies, they are holding the fiber too long. And that's what allows that fiber to kink up. I am actually releasing it really fast. Let's see. Oh, that looks really good. That is about the thickness that I'm interested in. Here we go. And that's going to poof a bit. Give me a really nice, kind of like a heavy sport, light worsted. Okay, anyway, look, I'm traveling really fast, but I'm also, I'm also drafting really fast. If you're not drafting this fast, I don't recommend you treadle this fast. Take it nice and slow. Put it on the biggest whirl. Take it nice and slow. You want to make sure that your feet, your hands can keep up with your feet. That's what will stop you from having all that kinky yarn. Unless, of course, you want kinky yarn, then you just hold on to the fiber longer than uh, normal, and that will give you that twisty yarn. I'm also pretty meticulous about bumps. I, this fiber could have used a second pass. I'm so lazy when it comes to carding. So what I'm doing with my other hand that's in the drafting zone is I am teasing out some of these places where I should have just carded it better. And that's usually because I either allowed a piece of vegetable matter like this that was in the, the BFL or I allowed uh, a piece of uh, Angora that was chunked up in there without separating it or I allowed a short and for me a short fiber pretty much is anything that's two inches and under uh, all my fiber is so much longer so something that's not the same length as the rest of the fiber will disrupt the flow here sometimes stuff falls when you're spinning, but when we're talking about Angora or BFL, BFL in particular too, you don't always get it to fall out. So I wouldn't count on that. Okay. Let me turn this back around. I don't generally spin head on, so I have to be mindful that I need to stay into the camera view.
I'm at home, so I don't have a, as wide an angle shot as I would if I was at the studio. All right, let me stop for a moment. Um, machines do t have a tendency to walk. Uh, usually when I spin, I have a rug underneath me to keep the machine from walking. Let's see if that did well. Okay, oh, that's much better. I keep saying I'm going to put some feet on the bottom of it, but I never got around to it. Here we go. That was too thin. Got to fix that. Here we go. Some people say they like to listen to podcasts. Personally, I tend to find people distracting while I'm spinning, uh, which is why when I'm at fiber shows and all that kind of stuff, I never get much spinning done. Or any of our spinning groups I prefer to put something on that I've seen before that way I'm not interested in what's actually happening but I don't necessarily like to spin in silence because the sound of the wheel gets on my nerves <laughs> somebody asked me to do a video and something's clicking somebody asked me to do one of those was the ASMR videos with just the wheel and I was like, I uh, no, because hearing the wheel actually irritates me. And something, oh, I think that's what that is. I can hear it clicking. That's the place where the dry band snapped and I melted it back together. So I could hear it clicking and the clicking gets on my nerves. When this wheel is in tip top shape, it hardly makes a sound. The last time I used it, I was out teaching lessons, so it was in the car back and forth. And uh, that's at the point where I cracked the knob for the storage for the, the was the flyers. For the, uh, oh boy, what are they called? The whirls? Yes. So I cracked that, and then somehow I kind of knocked the bottom foot off for the wheel. I have no business traveling with this wheel. So it, it really needs, it could stand to be tightened. I have to do that at some point. Maybe uh, during a plying video, I'll tighten it so you can see the difference. What that does tell me is exactly how many times this drive band is turning because for every click, it's the drive band um, passing over top of the whirl. So it's turning one complete revolution for every time I'm pressing that. So it's literally going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And that flyer is going around quite a bit. I can't even begin to tell you how many times that thing is going around for every turn of the wheel. Okay, here's something I know you want to know and you really need to know, but it's hard for me to explain to you on a wheel. It's something that's much easier to show you on a spindle. Is you want to know if this fiber is really holding together. On a spindle, I would just hold the spindle, and if the fiber dropped off, then you would know that it's um, not really holding together. On the wheel, you don't have that kind of gravity tension, so I can't really say to you... I can just say to you that I know it's holding together because I've done this enough, but it's not something I can really show to you. But what you can do is you can stop, 
and you can just kind of pull at it. And so if it was not holding together very well, it would break apart. Um, this also too goes to the comment about using Angora for warp. I need to show you a bobbin of pure Angora. It's somewhere in one of the drawers. But if I took the bobbin of pure Angora and did the same thing, it would be less bounce because Angora does not have the same memory as some wolves. I don't want to say no memory because that's wrong too, but that's a whole different story. But with this BFL added, I get a little more snap back that I might not get if I had 100% Angora. But at, the whole point is that under tension, under tension, this is not breaking. If it was, what is this on here? I think this is cotton. This might be silk. But under tension, it would not break. Let me grab that real quick out of the drawer. And let's see. Is this the end door? Yep, this is the end door. Okay, so this is a bobbin of Angora. This, this, I think this is the mystery wool, the hated mystery wool. This thing did not go very well for me. So I actually spun over it with Merino. Look at that, Merino. And you can hear one boing, 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 boing. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so here's the Angora. I'm not sure where the end of that is. As you can tell, I never finished this bobbin, and I just simply tied a loop over top of it and kept going. Okay, so, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling pretty nicely on it. It's kind of making that boop, 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 boop sound, but it's not as jingly as the wool. Uh, I would work with this no problem. It'll hold up. Depending on how much tension you put on the warp and, you know, what kind of pedals you're using, I, there's no reason why in the world this would not hold up as warp. Oh, it'll be fine. If you have some complications and you're worried that it's not going to hold up, just size your warp. But if you spin for it, it'll be fine. You spin the yarn that you want. For the purpose that you want it and that's why we're all spinners okay here we go i toy with the idea of getting a woolly winder for this uh, first off woolly winders are very expensive i could buy a new wheel for the price of a woolly winder they're like 300 something bucks i didn't pay that much for my louette just barely and number two I think it's a good idea to pause my hands periodically because if the woolly winder is doing it for me, I'm not taking any breaks. And I don't think that's a good idea. Especially for me in the 10 dinas I get frequently, which keeps me from spinning as much as I used to. It just makes more sense for me just to stop. And I can wind pretty evenly so that I can max out my bobbin so it's really not a big deal for me to stop and wind. Okay, that is basically about it. I don't know offhand what the size of this bobbin is. The ladybug bobbins because I have five of them. And so, unlike the Louette, where I only have three, I wasn't so concerned about how much fiber I could pack onto them. Matter of fact, all of these bobbins all have something different on them. Because I just stop in the middle of a project sometimes because I'm spinning for videos and not necessarily projects. So, they all have something different on them. And basically, I just usually wind it off into a center pull ball and I ply from a center pull ball. So I could spin to fill this bobbin and use the same bobbin and it doesn't really matter. So I'm assuming I can get the entire four ounces onto this bobbin. I think so. So basically what I want to know is 
do you want me to apply from another bobbin onto a bobbin or do you want me to apply from a center pool ball which is like my favorite thing to do and I have some serious thoughts about applying from a center pool ball that you probably need to know so if that's of interest I will most certainly do the center pool ball thing because that is my favorite thing to do Okay, that's it for now people hopefully uh, you all have chosen your fiber and you've completed processing it and you're starting on your spinner journey and if you are not using a wheel we need to talk I do already have several videos uh, in my Angora fiber list about spinning from a spindle and I had promised to have that class up. I have the spindle class up. I don't have the Angora spinning class up. So you can watch the videos on Teachable about the spinning, basic spinning class. It's a free class. And you can watch my videos on YouTube about Angora spinning. If you have any questions, just put them in the Angora group or if you're watching the replay, Drop them down in the comments below on YouTube, and I will answer those questions. Hey everybody, take care. Have a great day.